I'm very pleased to be here. I think the fifth time this year in Vienna, really a great city. And we are confronted, of course, everywhere in the world with a lot of complex problems. Global problems, in fact, like a financial crisis, conflict, war, a climate change. And that calls for a new kind of science, global system science. Why global system science? Well, first of all, systems become more and more connected and also more and more interdependent. And at the same time, they have global impacts. That means we need to have system science applied to global systems. And we need to have science of global systems altogether. And that requires, of course, an interdisciplinary approach. It requires a global collaboration. And it requires a grand integration of knowledge. So one of the issues that people have been puzzled about in science a lot is the micro macro problem, in particular in the social sciences. And of course, we are aware that the whole is more than the sum of its parts. Yeah, one of the founding insights of uh, complexity science, of course, but it's much older than that. And the question is, yeah, what, how do we understand these emergent properties that we find in our economy, in our society, and many other places? Well, I'd like to focus in my talk a little bit about the issue of coordination and cooperation, because those are also questions related uh, to the sustainability goals that the United Nations have recently decided to go about. And so that concerns environmental exploitation, environmental pollution, overfishing, and many other tragedies of the commons. And these kind of problems have um, been addressed by evolutionary game theory and in many other ways, of course, too. And I'd like to start with a problem which is not yet a social dilemma problem, but uh, that allows me to introduce evolutionary game theory. So let's suppose we have two pedestrians who have to walk around each other. And what we find in many cases is that uh, there is actually the formation of lanes of uniform walking direction. In many countries, people keep on the right-hand side, but uh, in other places, they keep on the left-hand side. So there are social conventions, and the question is, why are they coming about? Now, we can formulate this in terms of a coordination game. So if both people go to the right, then obviously they succeed to evade each other, and so they have been successful that gives them a positive payoff, a benefit. If one goes right, the other one goes left, it turns out they will be standing in front of each other again, and so they have to try another time. They didn't succeed, they get zero payoff. If both go to the left-hand side, then both have a benefit. So that's basically the coordination game, and many of you are, of course, well aware of it. And Basically, if you want to understand how the relative proportion of going to the right and going to the left changes in time, then we use the replicator equation. And we would plug in this payoff matrix and we would eventually get this equation over here. Now, next thing we would do is look for the stationary solution of this. And in fact, there are three stationary solutions. Then the second next, second next thing is that you would look for the eigenvalues, and it turns out that this 50-50 situation that seems to be the natural solution for that problem that we are confronted with here is unstable. While everyone going to the right or everyone going to the left is a stable solution. And that's actually why, if we start with a 50-50 situation, small deviations, small perturbations will drive the system away from the 50-50 solution and eventually into a situation where they agree on a social convention. Now, the very same replicator equation can also be figured out together with other kind of payoff matrices. And of course, the prison's dilemma is one of the most interesting games that people have studied. It's an example of a social dilemma game where cooperation would be favorable for everyone and uh, non-cooperative behavior wouldn't be good at all. But the problem is that if one of us cooperates and the other one doesn't, the other one 
gets a higher payoff called temptation and uh, I would walk home with a very poor payoff and that destabilizes the cooperative solution and leads to a situation where the system would end up in a non-cooperative solution. I mean, cooperation would be desirable but unstable and that's why we end up in a tragedy of the commons. Now, there are a number of circumstances under which cooperation nevertheless can flourish and some of these circumstances uh, are related to neighborhood interactions. So let's look at this circle over here. We assume that people interact with their neighbors uh, in uh, some social dilemma game and it turns out if we add some links in order to imitate or to simulate in a sense globalization so we add more and more links here what we see is that in the beginning the level of cooperation goes up so we would tend to engage even more into networking of the system to create more cooperation and so on but then eventually there is a turning point and if you go on networking the world, then eventually cooperation goes down. In fact, that is expected because we know that the replicator equation would describe the fully connected state and that leads to a tragedy of the commons. Well, some people think, such as Andy Haldane from the Bank of England, that we've seen a similar situation actually in the banking system and that an overconnected banking system might have contributed actually to the instability of the financial system. And uh, in fact, here is a nice video created by Frank Schweitzer and his collaborators showing bankruptcy cascades in the aftermath of the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers. And as you can see over here, hundreds of banks fail, causing losses of hundreds of billions of dollars. Now, these kinds of cascade effects are found in many different systems. Here is an experimental system that shows you impressively how a single local perturbation could eventually mess up the entire system if just the system is connected to a certain overcritical extent. And in fact, the flash crash that we've seen, for example, on May 6, 2010, which might have crashed the financial system even, uh, that also resulted from cascading effects, but um, in this time that happened within just 20 minutes. So, yeah, certainly we can't risk a collapse of the financial system, we can't risk a collapse of global systems, so we need to think about resilient designs of these systems and we need to have engineered breaking points to stop such kind of cascades. Of course, the kind of engineering solution would very much depend on the kind of system we're looking at. Now, let's look a little bit more into the possibilities to stabilize cooperation globally because, you know, in a sense, solving the environmental and also global warming issues are related to cooperation problems. And one of the approaches used today a lot is uh, to pull punishment. It means uh, we pay into a common pot through taxes. Then uh, from this uh, we pay police and surveillance and basically we would enforce that uh, people would do certain kinds of things or not do other kinds of things. Now it turns out that this is not always working so well as we've seen in Ferguson and Baltimore and many other places and actually later on I will explain why this is not working well in a multicultural setting while it worked well in a, in a monocultural setting. Now but just to give you a little bit more of an idea of why I don't believe that this surveillance approach would be solving our problems. Now let's look at this circular traffic. It's not very difficult to drive in a circle. Everyone has a driver's license, well-educated. Everyone has the information he needs. Um, everyone wants to avoid this phantom traffic jam. And I can claim that even if we knew every single thought of these people, we couldn't prevent 
traffic jams from forming. Why can I say this? Because there's a mathematics of traffic jams which basically says that above a certain critical density, small perturbations would amplify and eventually create again something like a cascading effect that causes this undesirable outcome. <clears throat> so systemic instability is a problem. We can see the problem happen through surveillance, but we can't stop it. And here is another interesting example. We've made experiments in our lab with people, decision experiments, where a simple best response rule, a deterministic mathematical model can actually predict 96% of all decisions. Now, this is an amazingly accurate micro model for decision making, but it turns out that actually the experimental results are not at all described well by that deterministic model. And the stochastic model actually surprisingly does much better. So the question is, why is this the case? And the reason is that, again, we have here a system that's unstable with regard to small perturbations. So one or two single deviations actually can cause a cascade that leads to a completely different macroscopic outcome. Now, there is another surprise. If we add some noise to this highly accurate deterministic micro model, that means we make it less accurate in terms of predicting individual behaviors. The macro outcome is actually described much more accurately. And that's because now we're taking into account this issue of instability. So we really have to revisit actually the way we model systems and the way we want to manage and control them. And in fact, it turns out that from the very beginning of humankind, there have been decentralized mechanisms to support cooperation. Starting from kin selection and genetic therapy over direct reciprocity, that means helping each other, friendships in a sense, repeated interactions. And so the main question really is, what social mechanism would allow you to transform your prisoner's dilemma or social dilemma into another kind of game that would allow for cooperation or even established cooperation by itself. And in fact, it turns out that these different kinds of mechanisms transform the prisoner's dilemma in different ways. So we get different kinds of outcomes. And in that way, we can kind of solve cooperation problems. And in fact, there are a number of other mechanisms. I can't mention them all on there. Thousands of papers about these kinds of mechanisms, but reputation related to indirect reciprocity is one of the most important modern mechanisms, I would say. And I believe that's the reason why reputation mechanisms are spreading all over the web these days, because they're so useful to support cooperation in high quality. But there are other mechanisms, such as merit-based matching. That means if you match those who are more cooperative with other people who are more cooperative, then it turns out that this is not only good for cooperative people, but it also creates a trend towards more cooperation. And also, costly signaling and, and competition are other mechanisms that can actually increase the level of cooperation, to mention just a few mechanisms that I think should, could be used more to go about climate change and environmental change and all this. So we could build digital platforms, information systems, all sorts of systems that would help people to be more cooperative. Here is a particularly astonishing example. What we're looking at is, again, a social dilemma situation. I believe that was a public goods game we looked at. And uh, we are actually studying here four different strategies. So one is defection, shown in red. One is cooperation, shown in blue. But those cooperators don't punish defectors. While moralists, shown in green, 
don't only cooperate, they also punish non-cooperative individuals. And finally, immoralists would be defectors punishing other defectors. Forget about them, they're not so important actually in this game. Now, if we have all of these individuals interact with each other, or interact with randomly chosen other individuals, then what happens is that the cooperators crowd out the moralists because moralists pay a price for punishment, it's costly punishment. So as a result, moralists disappear and the cooperators actually stay with the defectors and the defectors would exploit them and we would end in a tragedy of the commons. However, we would get a very different outcome if people interact spatially with their neighbors and imitate the best performing neighbor's strategy. What we get then is what you can see over here, starting with a really random initial condition, we find cluster formation, similar strategies would be next to each other. And in the beginning, it looks like defection would win through, as we expect, actually. Right? But then surprisingly, over time, actually the defectors go down in numbers and we end up with more or less in the very end. And that is kind of surprising, actually, when I showed that to Herb Gintis, a very smart colleague, as you know. He couldn't believe that and he sat down to program that and check it out. And of course, um, he found the same result. And now the, the reason for that difference for the fact that the representative agent model fails to predict the outcome correctly. In fact, we get just the opposite outcome from what is expected according to the representative agent model. The reason for this is that now cooperators and moralists are separated from each other by defectors. And defectors would eliminate the cooperators by the moralists would actually go after the defectors. There's another interesting mechanism, which is success-driven migration, where people would look for more favorable places in a certain radius around them. And it turns out that in a very surprising way, if we combine that with noises that would otherwise actually destroy cooperation, we are ending up with a high level of cooperation. So we all start with defectors. You can see because of uh, migratory noise, people are spread out of all over the system. And for a long time, <coughs> the factories are really prevailing. Then, however, after 25,000 iterations, a supercritical cluster of cooperators occur just by chance. And the nucleation effect sets in. As soon as that has happened, actually, the cooperation quickly spreads all over the system. <clears throat> so that will be almost all blue if we just wait a little bit longer. <clears throat> Question is, would that happen also in reality? And so we've done experiments in the lab with real people, and it turns out actually mobility is improving the level of cooperation. Otherwise, it would really disappear. That's kind of interesting. You know, and I don't want to connect that with the current debate, but certainly we haven't thought that these kinds of mechanisms would be able to support cooperation. And so there are many unexplored mechanisms that we could use in future. Now, there's also another important point. People are more cooperative than expected. In fact, many people have social preferences. Now, I see the countdown is... Uh, going ahead very quickly, so I won't go into all the details, but you'll find this paper about self and other regarding preferences in scientific reports together with Thomas Grund. And it turns out that under most parameter combinations, we would find homo economicus as a result from an evolutionary process as expected. But there is a corner where actually people would end up with social preferences, where they would be friendly to others and would be concerned about their payoff too. And that happens actually when children are raised in the neighborhood of parents. That is kind of an interesting and quite surprising discovery. So 
the evolution has made many of us other regarding, and I think that that is actually very important for the success of humankind. It takes, however, quite a number of generations until we have this outbreak of friendliness and cooperation. And uh, as a result, actually, that creates something like network thinking or network decision making. This is what you see over here, the uh, resulting distribution of friendliness values, I mean, other regardedness, and actually a very similar result is found experimentally, as you can see over here. So while there are some selfish people, obviously, uh, a large number of people have some degree of pro-social preferences, and that was also known, actually, to Adam Smith already. So it's about time that this enters our economic models. Uh, it can explain not only the emergence of social preference, but also the cooperation between strangers. And I'd like to say that this homo socialis, as I call this species of humans that uh, have social preferences is not just a small deviation from homo economicus, but it's another stationary solution. And while homo economicus might be approximated in decision-making by statistically independent decision-making, homo socialis requires complexity sciences describe the behavior because it always depends on the payoffs of others. That means these Homo socialists are putting themselves into the shoes of others and consider the impact on others. And thereby, they succeed in overcoming the tragedy of the commons. That is the interesting point. So um, I believe for that reason, besides uh, an economic theory that is made for Homo economicus, we should also elaborate an economic theory that is built around homo socialism, and also think about institutions such as reputation systems that would support uh, homo socialis in being cooperative and uh, protect him from exploitation. Now, of course, the world is more difficult than this, and people are different, obviously, and they have different preferences, different utility functions, something that we can understand, by the way, with the model that I presented just before. But from this difference result other problems. So we would have several populations, in this case population one and two, and then the question is you know, how would people behave if one population prefers this and the other population prefers that. And in fact, there are a number of different outcomes. Either everyone would just do what they want, kind of a laissez-faire society, or one population would set the norm and the other one would adjust to, uh, the behavior to that behavior that it doesn't prefer. And in fact, um, we find both these cases, depending on the parameters of the experiment in our laboratory, and uh, we can look at other multi-person games too, and then we find actually a, a very rich variety of different possible outcomes, and all of them, I believe, can be found in reality. So that very simple tour population game allows us to understand quite a number of different economic and social situations, in including conflict, I believe, that's, of course, also an important issue. And that there are interrelations between interactions, conflict, and migration that we need to consider if you want to understand conflict dynamics. And we have looked into this, actually, in the case of the Middle East, uh, specifically Jerusalem. And we found out that uh, cultural distance is actually a major determinant that uh, determines the outcome of the interaction. Now, <clears throat> in a monocultural situation, we use punishment of deviation from social norms to reinforce social norms. If we do the same thing in a multicultural setting, actually, what happens often is escalating conflict because 
what is wrong from the point of view of one population might be just exactly the right behavior from the point of view of the other behavior. So if you punish that behavior, that person would say, how do you dare to punish me for doing what is actually exactly right? And then this creates a counter strike and basically a re revenge dynamics that leads to escalating conflict. And that's why I was saying the mechanism that was creating social order in a monocultural setting is actually destroying social order in a multicultural setting. And that's why we need to have new social mechanisms to create social order. And of course, a lot of things can be understood now with data that is becoming available about human activities, big data, big data that allows us to understand spreading of conflict, uh, spreading of knowledge, of ideas, and uh, spreading of culture, and also spreading of diseases. And uh, you certainly have read about this model, so I shorten this part a little bit. And so in conclusion, I believe that we are getting to this point where we are understanding the underlying reasons for all sorts of problems that we have in the world. Many of these problems are based on systemic instabilities of various kinds. And we can come up with better system designs and management and in particular experiments, but also computer simulations can help us to understand these kind of phenomena and how they interact. So I'm kind of hopeful that we can solve the problems of humankind if we are willing to change the way we are trying to solve them. So that requires a paradigm shift in thinking and a paradigm shift in the solutions. And so I'm very glad to see that there is a huge community, an interdisciplinary global community that is ready to do this change. Thank you very much.